Hi, I'm Sarah Mohan and this is Tigris on Tuk Tuk, a show born out of my endless love for nature, made especially for this magnificent breed of human, the urbanite. We bring you all kinds of stories from all kinds of people and we try and tell it in a way that sticks in our highly urbanized brain cells, which usually don't have room for much else other than all the mundane day-to-days. So this week's story is an extra special one, all wrapped up in silk and other fine things. These critters are probably what inspired the word creepy crawlies. They can be hairy, most of us would say definitely scary. They are fast and furious, superb scuttlers and stealth masters, incredible architects, trapeze artists and zany zipliners who've learned not just how to survive, but dominate every nook, cranny or crevice they're in. And they are everywhere. Their crazy dazzling diversity is what I find most amazing about spiders. I mean, you can be in some sterile office on the 52nd floor with not even a half-dead potted plant in sight, and you will still find this little black blotch scuttling vertically up a wall. Spiders are straight up incredible, okay? If you don't agree, that's fine. Most of us, myself included, have at some point thought or think, that spiders are nothing but horrid, hairy, fear-inducing bugs. Well, first things first, spiders are not bugs. Not insects at all. And much like that, there's so many other misbeliefs we have about them. This episode is by no means a way to try and get you to fall in love with spiders, but it's just an attempt to take a crack at getting us to understand that spiders are just so rad and certainly don't deserve to be introduced to the underside of a flip-flop. Right, I understand the fear and the disgust and the screaming, and that's precisely why today's guest is the best possible human I could have ever hoped for to have on the show for a spider chat. Like most people, the first time he met a spider, he thought they were revolting creatures. He was in the mobile advertising world at the time, and his metamorphosis from apathetic, oblivious city kid to head-over-heels spider lover is a remarkable story in itself. He's the co-founder of Spiders and the Sea, a social enterprise that works towards bridging nature and people. He also is a musician with a particular affinity for the blues. In fact, you're actually hearing his Spider-Man blues in the background. I visited him and his wife Chetna at their home for an interview plus lunch date and we had a lovely time. We talked spiders, but as we always do on Tigris on Tuk Tuk, we went off for a look about around the hood and spotted all kinds of spiders. Oh, we even witnessed this cool, action-packed, natio-type sequence of an ant trying to sabotage a spider while she moved in the branches of a tree. Ah, so much excitement. So buckle up, you're in for a treat. Here's researcher, nature writer, photographer, blues player, hilariously deadpan joke teller with his infinite love for spiders and scrumptious bowls of sambar, Samuel John. And you say you play the blues for the spiders. I do, I do. See, one of the reasons I like to play the blues for the spiders Mm -hmm. is that they tend to be less vocal about their criticisms. Um, <laughs> that's my preferred audience. <laughs> so my full name is Samuel Joshua John. Mm-hmm. Um, for perspective, my father's name is Suresh Kumar. So there's a, there's <laughs> okay. a fascinating story behind how I was named. But one of the parents said John, the other parent was like, how, how do you get to name him? He's our kid. So they picked Samuel. Um... <laughs> Somewhere my grandmother was upset, so they snuck in a Joshua to <laughs> okay. keep her happy. And that that's that's that was the that's the long and short of it. <laughs> but my no, name but what is the short of it? Like what do people always call you? Wait, so that that gets uh, even more complicated, right? Because my first name is Samuel, but I go by John. Yeah. Because <laughs> when my parents decided to enroll me in school, um, they registered me as Samuel Joshua John. Mm-hmm. But they decided to write S J John on my notebooks. Now, for some reason, back in the early nineties, um, that was your official ID, mm-hmm. your notebook label. Mm-hmm. So my 
the teachers in my class decided to start calling me John and then I was like okay my name is John right and I went through my whole <laughs> life believing that <laughs> until the 10th grade when you know the official register comes yeah. into and then so my teacher started calling me Samuel and I'm like who's that and then oh, that's identity you. crisis yes he's also had some completely random nicknames an uber guy decided that Samuel John was Samir Jain of course once he told his buddies this the name stuck like really stuck and they all promptly took their phones out and changed my name of to course. Samir Jain on their phone oh now we live in a world where actions have consequences right <laughs> so when they all did that um my name on true call it changed to Samir Jain So oh, no. yeah so yeah, people who didn't really already have my number oh my god would then get a notification that said Samir Jain anytime i called them they called me <laughs> definitely the most interesting name story i've heard yet okay so how did samuel john stumble upon spiders taking it back a little bit for context mm-hmm. um i grew up in the city right like mm-hmm. i was a very bangalore boy mm-hmm. um and then i got into a job I, i was in mobile advertising for the longest time and during that time i traveled and everything else but i did not notice any form of life other than the human form if you will mm-hmm. uh with even the slightest of interest it was just it was how i was programmed and then i met uh, my partner mm-hmm. and uh, we went on this lovely walk through the gkbk campus mm-hmm. um and i looked around and i was like wow your campus is beautiful you know mm-hmm. so much greenery here but it must be snake infested <laughs> and uh, there was a slight twitch in her eye and she said uh, <laughs> snake inhabited <laughs> i was like shit <laughs> sec like, yeah i think it was it was a simultaneous whip crack and a light bulb going off in right. my head um so quite beautiful <laughs> Uh, so I was going through that whole process right and I know that many people eventually you know when somebody else gives them some perspective or an introduction mm. to the natural world they eventually have something that becomes this paradigm shifting animal that just enters yeah. their mind and as a usually it's a tiger or this very <laughs> colorful bird or something of that yeah. sort and it's usually on a safari or I went on this lovely walk <laughs> uh mind didn't start so serendipitously mm. um I went back after a long day of work frustrated as you would imagine <laughs> um and i used to live on uh, the top floor of my parents house there mm-hmm. a little thing going on there and a lovely garden out front where i just started growing a whole bunch of plants what didn't register in my head back then was that with these plants came other forms of life mm-hmm. so what had happened was there was a lovely clock vine that was climbing on this uh, the structure that we had on the terrace and one night when i came back and i was walking through towards my room mm-hmm. i found my entire torso covered in web oh nice and i panicked <laughs> get off of me shrieking okay. and running and shrieking there was a yeah. lot of shrieking also oh there was and, okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> and i was like yeah i'm going to go back for revenge but i was terrified even, <laughs> even then <laughs> shoe in hand i said not no shoe and torch in hand i slowly made my way back and i and i shined the torch towards where i thought the web was i could see a broken uh, web mm. with with little bits hanging from the top and then i was looking for the spider and i could see something tiny just scuttling into one of the pipes and i was like i'm going to get you i'll get you my pretty <laughs> so i went back and i googled <laughs> how to kill spider or something <laughs> of that sort i was very thorough at my job right, right. so i was going to be very thorough here as well so i was like let me do research for when this thing comes out what does it do yeah so after doing a little bit of that background uh for the assassination um i ended up it, it was a bit of it's some weird variant of the stockholm syndrome <laughs> I fell in love with my target. <laughs> Daddy, I love him. No. Um I was just like what a fascinating creature because in during that time I found out that this was a spider that recycled its web every day, right? Uh mm. that the reason I didn't see it in the morning when I left and ran it ran into it in the night mm. is because obvious uh build their webs during the night. Mhm. And then as dawn approaches, they consume that web. really they yeah. sort of yeah yeah draw it back into their system yeah and they're able to re- recycle about 90% of that protein so this spider would then come out um 
at night do this and then in the day disappear so i think that's fascinating mm. leading a much more sustainable life than mm. i am from that point onward that relationship started changing i stopped looking at how this... came as final yeah no that completely went out the door in a day or two and it it shifted to it was a sense of empathy right to say mm. that i live here so does this spider mm. um i can't bring up my like legal mm. documents and say mm-hmm. hey i actually own this land so yeah. please leave it lives here i live here we both do our own thing mm. and that was a nice space to enter uh, until i got emotionally involved with the spider mm. uh, these were still <laughs> early days before i was like hey it's all an ecological process um but i noticed that the spider was building her web just under the pipe that would mm-hmm. drain the water out from the roof so i was like damn as why are you doing that like that's not good for you as suspected her web would get washed off mm-hmm. every night for about two or three nights and in my head she looks now looks frail because she hasn't eaten in two days <laughs> mind you i'm still in a mobile advertising at this point <laughs> So I I was on a mission. I was like, you know, what? I'm going to f- make sure she gets enough food before the rain kicks in. Mm-hmm. So I come home early. Um so I started by killing some ants. So then I went and threw an ant onto her web and she panicked and ran. And then, oh my god. And then she actually tried she that. came back slowly and then she inspected this carcass and she just kicked it off her web. <laughs> and I was like, how ungrateful. <laughs> like, you know the trouble I went through for that. I found myself saying maybe she doesn't like ant right so oh i went and killed God. a mosquito and instantly i hadn't fully killed this mosquito uh, entirely by accident mm. and i threw it onto her web and i noticed that she went for it immediately mm. so then through some reading i i found out that they really like live prey that's yeah. caught in you know sort of giving some sort of prey cue if you will please tell me mate yeah so those are all sort of interesting ways for me <laughs> to I just got immersed in the natural history of this one spider. Right. Um And what kind of spider was this? She was a garden obby. Okay. And that is how Mr. Indifferent Samuel Joshua John fell in love with a chubby half a human thumb-sized cutie pie orb weaver. It's the stuff that could inspire the lyrics to a Taylor Swift love song. We were both young when I first saw John watched the spider have about 3 generations of her babies on his terrace and that really was the beginning of the rest of his life. Through that spider I ended up looking at the other spiders in my garden right and mm. I suddenly noticed that um and of course I was introduced to concepts like biodiversity all these words I mean mm. maybe I didn't get the concept but these words were thrown at me and I started to like delve into them a little bit more and mm. I started to realize that well whatever these people are talking about uh, from the sciences as mm. happening in the western ghats or you know all of these places it was happening on my terrace now was a, a lovely journey to go through mm. john demonstrated this first hand on our spider walk as well we didn't even make it out the door but stood transfixed in his living room squinting up at a mama spider on the wall this is a cellar spider uh the scientific name for the family is falsidae Mm-hmm. and uh, another fun name they have is daddy long legs oh right right so for the dogs here there's something particularly special going on mm-hmm. if you can see that spider there's a something that looks like a ball in front of its mouth mhm right mhm um, yeah it's hard to see from here but if you get a close up it's quite spectacular so i guess we we'll leave this to just very good voice acting on both of us yes. uh-huh. with some exclamation <laughs> and everything <laughs> but um, no but i do see the ball like thing so that me. ball like thing is um, basically it's egg sac okay so the spider once she is uh, well ready to deposit her eggs uh uh-huh. make like a sort of sheet okay. put her eggs in them mm-hmm. and then this nice silk cradle if you will mm-hmm. and then she'll carry it around with her right for safe keeping okay. so that's another fascinating is it just stuck on her Ah uh, no, she's holding it with her mouth parts. Oh my god! So what's incredible is when people think of spiders. I think there's a lot of different things that are associated with spiders, right? Webs and scary and whatnot. Mm. Uh, but I don't think we stop and appreciate moments like this where that's a mother basically be caring for her young, right? Mm. For her babies. Um, so there's parenthood there, and these are opportunities for empathy that's happening right inside our homes. So I started to look at all the tiny little spiders in and around, and incidentally, at that at that time, I just got a uh, well a 
fairly nice phone with a nice camera mm-hmm. so i went and took a picture of that spider and i could actually see the spider wrapping the mosquito and i was like wow i can take pictures and <laughs> so that was the start of my photography journey as well right. so it all most of my life then that that i lead now seems to have somewhere originated from some interaction with the spider which is right. why i guess they're so close mm. uh, to me so what is a spider for those who don't know i mean uh, the only thing i can i always tell people is oh they're not insects but what is a spider biologically well one way you distinguish spiders from insects is that they have eight legs mm-hmm. whereas insects have six mm. um i think largely they all come from the same place uh, but arachnids early on sort of set up shop on their own if you look at them from an evolutionary origin um of course there's a lot of missing pieces in between mm-hmm. um at least from what i've seen because there's only so far back you can go before you stop finding fossil evidence because mm-hmm. well things disintegrate right mm-hmm. uh, unfortunately there were no plastic containers about 500 <laughs> million years ago <laughs> that would have been an answer yeah. Mm. yeah so i think early on this year there was uh, a discovery with a 420 million year old scorpion those are sort of your first origins of what this group looks like the arachnid group mm-hmm. so are, mo- all arachnids have eight legs i mean there's another thing called the chelicerae so mm. they are defined by uh, these mouth parts that they have mm. that are called the chelicerae so that group is called the chelicerata okay so all arachnids come under this group of chelicerata named so because they have these mouth parts called chelicerae which are pincer like jaws kind of like a folding knife which they use to catch and hold prey and inject venom with. They also have these unique structures called pedipalps right next to the chelicerae. I've always thought pedipalps are adorable, like little mouth fingers, but they aren't limbs. They function more like insect antennae and give the bearer a better sense of the world and are used for feeding and courtship rituals. So the arachnid group is large and includes not just spiders but other things like scorpions, mites, ticks, among other critters. So they share an ancestor but branched off at some point. So spiders on scorpions, right? Something sets them apart. And this became super clear when an old fossil of an almost spider was unearthed in France some years ago. So there was a fossil that I think is dated back about 305 million years ago, mm. uh which is an almost spider. Okay. So coming down to what defines a spider, that sort of answers this question, right? So spiders have those eight legs mm-hmm. they have the chelicerae mm-hmm. these mouth parts um but what really defi- defines a spider within that arachnid chelicerata uh, bracket are the spinnerets they have spinnerets right spiders have these organs called spinnerets mm-hmm. um which are actually specialized organs that just sort of draw out, like from where they draw out the silk mm-hmm. there are silk organs inside that produce the proteins themselves oh. in their liquid form um as it comes out of the spinneret it takes on its solid form right now the other thing is these spinnerets necessarily need to be at the back of the abdomen for it to be considered a spider so okay that fossil from 305 million years ago i think it's called edmonarachne brasileri or something of that right. sort mm-hmm. um had silk uh, organs and some kind of a spigot to release that silk but it was at the base of its abdomen okay which might have been used to line burrows and stuff a little more effectively mm. so basically 305 million year old edmon arachne didn't quite make it to the spider club cuz she did not have spinnerets okay i have to do a silky sidebar here cuz it'll blow your mind honestly spinnerets are a spider's magic wand and silk its spell The silk producing apparatus consists of silk glands and spigots that are present internally. They produce and pull out the silk, woven together by the external protrusions called spinnerets. Spiders have them poking out on their underside, right by their butthole. Most spiders can produce multiple kinds of silk. Orb weavers, for example, produce 6 or 7 varieties, and they control the thickness, strength, flexibility, and stickiness of these fibers based on what they need to use the silk for. Silk is one of the strongest natural materials on earth. Spider silk even more so than that of insects like moths, which also produce silk, but a different kind altogether. 
some spider silk is about five times stronger than steel, at least in terms of tensile strength and elasticity. Webs can catch large, fast-flying insects without breaking and are also extremely light and clean with antimicrobial properties. Why am I going on and on about spider silk? Because while us city folks cringe at the sight of cobwebs and dust them off, teams of researchers around the world are working on producing synthetic spider silk. It's not possible to hoard spiders in a lab and mass-produce silk because, well, the spiders will end up eating each other. But scientists have already produced synthetic silk through genetically modified bacteria and silkworms. And apparently it can be used in a bunch of industries like medicine, sports, architecture, fashion and beauty, and military apparel, as in bulletproof vests. It costs a bomb to do this right now, and it's all early days, but we might soon live in a world where we have spider silk bandages, gossamer artificial ligaments, and silken seatbelts. What are they kind of doing all day? What's a spider's POA? So it depends. Uh, so on a typical day, you'll find a spider just, if it's a web builder, mm -hmm. it's going to be sitting on its web, waiting for prey. If it's a diurnal spider it's waiting on its web during the day mm -hmm. at night if it's nocturnal when it's not on the web eating or catching prey usually spiders hang out in things called retreats mm. so they're tiny silken uh, objects in which mm. they go and hide these are built by both web building spiders as well as non-web building spiders mm. um, so retreats have a multitude of purposes one is to obviously go and rest when they're not doing their thing um, the other would be to raise their young that's mm -hmm. where they go and throw their eggs in. And when spiders have to molt, they're particularly vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So that time they go hide themselves in a retreat as well. You can find retreats on walls, under tables, between leaves. Kind of like a silken Google sleep pod where the spider goes off for some me time. Retreats usually look like a dense, messy, cottony mass. Kind of like a balled up cobweb. Spider webs, on the other hand, are elaborate, intricate pieces of art. Nature's pièce de résistance. They come in all kinds of gravity-defying shapes and sizes. Horizontal sheets, vertical lattices, funnels, tents and cones. We saw a couple of orb weaver webs. And orb weavers really are the bosses of web weaving. Even the boys. So if, if it's the male of a web building spider, mm -hmm. uh, they're likely to build webs as well because that's how they hunt and that's yes. how they oh. eat um, okay. until they're ready to mate, in which case they wrap up and they go looking for the female. Mm. So usually when you look at a spider, um, it's hard to tell whether it's male, female, but in certain families and in certain genera, it's relatively simple because uh, the male of the species mm -hmm. is likely to be very 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 tiny so that there is a baby argiope those are signature orb weavers so if you're familiar with the orb weaver they build these wonderful two-dimensional web structures mm. that are quintessential web right they're mm. on spider-man suit and mm -hmm. everything these spiders in particular they build those structures but what they also do is that they line them with uh, some white lines called stabilimentum mm -hmm. now the reason for those stabilimentum have you seen those squiggly lines coming out mm. from near the legs? Yeah. Yeah. So that some say could be a defensive measure to make mm -hmm. the spider look a little larger than it actually is. There's one sort of rebel in the family, if you will. Mm -hmm. That one cousin who doesn't get along. Right. Um, and that you can see in the stairs here. Um, this is a genus called Sirtophora. Okay. Um, so what they do is they build three-dimensional webs. But if you look at the center of this web, uh -huh. there's actually one very fine two-dimensional sheet that's running along right. the middle. Uh, there's silk beneath it, silk above it, which acts as protective layers, uh -huh. um, as well as stuff that's falling from a tree will probably get caught in here. And the central sheet itself, sort of anchored in the middle, uh -huh. up towards the top. So it sort of pinches and pulls, ah. so that the two-dimensional sheet uh, lifts itself like a tent. Oh, I see. Uh, which earns them their name, tent web spiders. Oh, that's what these are? Yeah. Um, so, you were talking about web building and non-web building. Mm -hmm. And earlier on, you were sort of, you gave me the shiz on silk. But then, they can all produce silk, and then they don't build webs. And so, what are they doing with all this silk? Interesting. Uh, so, spiders like the crab spider, the jumping spider, they use this heavily in transportation. Mm. When they have to eventually create those retreats we were talking about, silk is used there as well. Mm. 
So when this, for example, does look like maybe a damaged bit of web, mm -hmm. uh, it's left over from a previous construction. But sometimes you'll find lines like this. In fact, if we come here, thinner lines like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are basically a uh, drag line that's possibly used by a jumping spider. So oh. when a jumping spider is moving around and it's jumping, it's fairly dangerous, right? Imagine the spider <laughs> had to go from here to here, yeah. uh, but missed. And it's going to find itself all the way on the floor and uh, trying to find its way back up. Mm -hmm. So what it'll do is when it's jumping from, say, uh, there to there, mm -hmm. it'll anchor a small bit of silk that's still connected to its bottom mm -hmm. and then jump. Mm -hmm. So, in case something should happen, it has a quick safety net to pull itself right. right. Jumping spiders are cutie patooties and my absolute favourite. They are fairly small. The common ones in urban areas are usually dark coloured and you'll find them indoors on walls and things. They've got these cute puppy dog eyes, but the way they move with these mini jumps, oh, so much sass. Such a delicious combination. If you want to work towards being less violent around spiders, start with the jumpers. This is a crab spider. So they usually are very, very well camouflaged on flowers. Mm. Uh, this one may need to do a little more work <laughs> on its... Uh... <laughs> on our walk, we also had this major cliffhanger moment and got all up in non-web silk when this small, milky white crab spider dragged her way out of certain death in the form of awaiting weaver ant jaws. And what is she doing? She was releasing a line of silk um, that's now anchored to that leaf on top oh and now she's making her way there so that's another way they get around so some of the lines we saw earlier of silk um, could be non-web building spiders like this crab mm. just using drag line to move from one place to another mm. and she's moving into dangerous territory there why there's an ant waiting for her on the other side of that line what oh there you go Ooh. that's a edge of the seat stuff <laughs> Don't die! <laughs> yeah, that's another useful wow. tagline. Right. Quick exits. <laughs> if you see that ant, it's uh -huh. actually trying to cut the dragline. Uh -huh. I see. <laughs> yeah, no, she looks like she's. Uh, she's safe. got it under control. Yeah, so, so she released another line from there. Yeah. To the oh side. Oh, goodness me. So these are very common uses of silk mm. that you'll find across species. Some novel uses, um, there's a spider called the net casting spider. Mm -hmm really phenomenal looking thing and uh, what it does with its silk is it drops down much like Tom Cruise mm -hmm. in the Mission Impossible movies drops mm -hmm. down from a line of silk and then she starts to create a net mm -hmm. she takes silk from her spinnerets and she starts weaving this elaborate net mm -hmm. and once she's done doing that um, she has another um, organ called the crybellum which okay. generates another type of silk called crybellet silk or woolly silk. Mm -hmm. And that is really, 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 really fine. One single strand of that, uh, when it's combed out, mm -hmm. can be about 10, maybe 100 nanometers. Thick. Ah, so it's like my hair frizzing out on a bad day. Pretty much. Right. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so she takes that and then that's coiled around the main net itself. Mm -hmm. So now that gets a sticky layer on top of it mm -hmm. as well. And then from her Tom Cruise position, um, when prey walks beneath her, she'll drop down and sort of ensnare them with her net. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that's quite phenomenal as well. Silk is a way of life. Spiders fashion it into all kinds of ingenious things that make living on the edge a walk in the park. There are some crazy spider stories, and I've linked quite a few of John's in the show notes. There, there are spiders that live along freshwater streams that you find here in India quite mm -hmm. easily. Fishing spiders and Ooh. such. If you go up towards Europe, there are spiders that will go diving. Mm -hmm. um, they actually make little scuba tanks on their abdomens using air trapped what? on the head. Oh. And they're able to dive underwater and go hunting. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's quite fascinating. But towards the sea, um, I think the closest thing you'll find are intertidal spiders. Oh. Um, so if you're familiar with the intertidal zone, mm -hmm. uh, which is where what gets submerged and, you know, mm -hmm. completely terrestrial during low tide, um, there are these spiders that sort of go into these rocky clusters, mm -hmm. find a tiny little gap, um, climb into those and pull a piece of kelp over them mm -hmm. to seal <laughs> wow. the entrance and make it airtight during high tide. Okay. So when the water rolls in, the spider is perfectly safe and when the tide recedes, 
um, the spiders come out and they hunt in the intertidal zone for small crabs and arthropods and whatever they can find. So spidey senses, uh, some have great eyesight, some don't, but they mm. all, ha- how many eyes do they got? Um, what spidey senses do you think are <laughs> interesting question. best used? I've, it, it really varies, right? Mm. Um, and I'd like to say that it's at a family level, but even there, there's so much variation. Mm. Um, some interesting examples for if you take the jumping spider they're mm-hmm. heavily reliant on sight mm-hmm. um, which is why they have their giant eyes mm-hmm. if you take the net casting spider that we were talking about mm-hmm. again extremely reliant on sight mm-hmm. um, web builders have tactile information coming to them from their webs itself from the, each vibration on the ground mm-hmm. now the huntsman that you see in your uh, in your bathroom so often for example, uses a combination of these things. They use mm. vibrations as well as their eyesight when they're hunting, mm. which is why you see eye shine in them at night as well. Right. Huntsmen are these long-legged, large, brown, grey, hairy spiders often found in bathrooms and can make an appearance precisely when you're in mid-pee. Despite their name, at least in India, you don't have to worry about them. Their large size can startle you, but there's an advantage to having them around. They feast on cockroaches, also found in bathrooms, and you get to work on your kegels. But there's a curious um, huntsman that lives in Laos, inside mm-hmm. a cave that was discovered. Um, so this is in the same family, right, as the huntsman in your bathroom. Mm-hmm. But here is a spider that has evolved without any eyes. So oh. the, its entire, you can see its head, you can Whoa. see its chelicery, it looks like any other huntsman in terms of that morphology. Um, but no eyes. Nothing? Because it lives inside a cave where there's absolutely no light. Mm. Um, so there's no need for eyes. So it's become heavily reliant on its tactile cues, whether it's vibrations or chemical changes. And mm. yeah, that's how it goes about living its life. Wow. Okay. Spiders have a sexy dusting of body hair. These smelling, tasting, vibration detecting hairs, along with things like the pedipalps, give the spider a fantastic multi dimensional view of the world. And then there are spiders like the Myrmirachne, a bunch of ant mimickers. Why pretend to be an ant, you ask? Well, each individual ant is stupidly strong, and with things like the weaver ants, you mess with one, you'll have to deal with a whole colony of pissed off warrior sisters. So, if you look like one, nobody in the animal kingdom messes with you. That's a crab spider that mimics uh, the weaver ant. It's called an emesia. Oh, she looks. I mean, yeah, she's a mimic. She looks exactly like the weaver ant when she wants to. Yeah, a lot of the uh, mimics that you find, especially the Myrmirachne, they use their mimicry defensively. They look like the weaver ant because a lot of things leave weaver ants alone. Mm. Um, as you can see, they're a fairly numerous bunch and they really mm. they work together. Mm. So the Myrmirachne have sort of figured that out and they say, hey, let's look like the ant so mm-hmm. that things leave us alone but Emesia does it for a different reason so you know that butt of hers that looks like the weaver ant's head mm-hmm. um, somewhere on this ant trail she'll point that butt outward mm-hmm. and sort of wiggle it wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Mm-hmm. so it looks like another it's ant like trying a... to communicate oh. now how weaver ants communicate is the antenate they touch their antenna with each other and right. they exchange chemical cues and everything mm-hmm. so for a curious weaver ant watching this uh, jiggly butt mm-hmm. basically goes up there to figure out hey are you trying to tell okay, me something come hither. yeah <laughs> at that point the spider turns around grabs the ant and then quickly drops on a line like we saw with the earlier crab spider oh. what that line does is it effectively neutralizes two of the ants biggest advantages um, one the now the ant can't call for backup because <laughs> well its backup is not particularly going to run down a line of silk yeah so it's now off the branch in its own domain, that right. spider. Um, the other thing is, most often I've seen the spider grasp the ant just behind the head. Okay. Um, between Stuff the he- of its neck then? Yeah, between the head and the thorax. Mm-hmm. And injects venom from there and then holds it in that position. And what's cool about that for me is mm-hmm. an ant is incredibly strong, right? It's able to lift many times its body weight. Mm. But you can't lift anything if there's no ground underneath you. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So your other strength is then neutralized. Yeah. So it's a very fascinating way of hunting at a tiny little uh, 
spider seems to have figured out. Um, and and what's their favorite? What do spiders eat? And you know, mm. is it usually insects and things? So, they eat a bunch of stuff. It's primarily insects, I mm-hmm. would say. Um, mm-hmm. I remember reading a paper that extrapolated the numbers and everything and found that spiders probably consume anywhere between 400 million to 800 million tons of insects every year. So wow. there are pretty that's one of their most significant ecological roles, mm-hmm. right? Uh, when a spider doesn't have too much to eat, it's going to eat another spider. Oh. Not too much remorse there. Mm. Uh, it's just the natural cycle of things. Right? Sure. And there are some uh, species of spiders that are known to prefer spiders in their mm-hmm. diet. Um, there's a really cool jumper called Portia. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's been at the center of a lot of research, uh, particularly for her intelligence. Um, and they found some pretty complex things. So when Portia has to hunt, she's hunting other spiders. And like we've seen, spiders are fairly well adapted. They're clever. They know what they're doing and all of that. Mm-hmm. Now imagine having to hunt one of those. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so she has to be two steps ahead of the Trick, game, if the you will. Yeah. What they found, I mean, even in the lab, was that Portia was able to use trial and error. She tried something, she realized it wasn't working. Wow. Figure out alternative. When you think of spiders, you just assume they're going to run towards an insect, jump on it and try to eat it. You would assume that a spider that's seeing another spider that it wants to eat will move in a, in a straight sort of path or whatever shortest path it can to just go and try and catch it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Portia will actually plan her approach. If you really watch them for long enough, you'll see them stalk their prey. It's almost like they're thinking for a moment before they act, which I think is a valuable lesson we can all learn <laughs> from spiders. I've always considered myself a very clever girl. So in India, um, do we have uh, spiders that are venomous? Or I mean, names like the huntsman sound pretty <laughs> daunting, but I know they're not. Uh, but do we have venomous spiders? And what are the things we need to worry about or be careful around? So the thing is, um, all spiders carry venom, right? That's how they hunt. But they carry enough venom for their prey, mm. typically. Mm. So if you get bitten, for whatever reason, you, if you do get bitten, mm-hmm. it's likely to leave a bump or a rash. Mm. A huntsman, for example, can deliver a pretty nasty bite just because it's so big. But mm. the venom is still not going to really do much. Mm. Um, I believe there is a list of what's defined to be medically significant uh, something. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but the reason I typically don't go into that too much is... Very often, in any audience that we're likely to interact with are not going to come yeah. anywhere close to any of these things because, you know, the way we keep our houses, our gardens and everything mm-hmm. else, if we're lucky, we'll have a few harmless spiders. So why are we so afraid then? What is, why, I mean, have you ever uh, figured yeah, no. it out? Arachnophobia, why? Okay, confession time. Until a few years ago, I was definitely intimidated by spiders. I mean, it was never a full-on meltdown like with cockroaches, but if I spotted a spider, I like to keep an eye on it at all times. Now, John's the best person to ask this question because he went from looking for a shoe murder weapon to love-struck spider fanboy. Arachnophobia is an interesting subject for me. I mean, just, just to sort of look at it because I've had people come up to me and say, hey, you know, you're talking about spiders, but, uh, well, I'm terrified of them. I think, I'm, I think I may have arachnophobia. But the question to then ask is, uh, well, do you really have arachnophobia? Because it's a fear that's usually, I mean, any phobia is diagnosed uh, by a professional. Uh, and the thing about a phobia is that it, it, it's debilitating, right? Um, when, when you do have arachnophobia, for example, and for those who do, I empathize with you, um, is that you're completely crushed by the fear. Uh, You're unable to move or you're unable to be in the same room as a spider or... uh, Yeah, there are some extreme examples of it as well. Most people I meet, um, it's not so much arachnophobia as it is just a general, well, mild amount of fear and possibly even disgust. Then I was like, okay, where where did it all go wrong? Uh, and, And then... Like many other things, I found uh, some issues starting in medieval Europe. Um, a lot of the text that I found from there, uh, even, well, quote-unquote, natural history books, uh, has a lot of references to spiders just being really venomous. Um, in fact, the old English word for spider is atocorpus, which means poison head, which can be slightly misleading. 
um, and I think there are some studies that have also sort of looked at how that association could have been made um, in Europe because, well, uh, they were figuring stuff out and they were hit by a plague and people were dying all over. So it was easy to sort of shift blame or assign blame to something that you don't really understand. And I feel like that sort of sentiment has traveled further west um, as some of these European communities moved to the Americas. And yeah, it's, it's a, sort of just continued there. And you can see it in the 50s and 60s, you know, movies like just sort of demonizing spiders. John told me about a movie called Lava Lantula, where a swarm of giant lava-breathing tarantulas take over the city of Los Angeles. There are several such eco-horror delights, which are all very well for entertainment, but don't make up the best bio for creatures like the spider. Even the studies that look at, uh, well, the fear of spiders and to understand whether it's an innate fear, right? Like it's, if it's something that is genetically coded into us. Um, some of the studies that have been done to show this are quite interesting because, well, one, uh, the sample is entirely skewed to the West, right? And even within that, um, I, and I'm nobody to comment on methodology and psychological research, but if you fundamentally look at it, what they're doing is they're measuring pupil dilation in babies. Um, basically, you show a baby a picture of a flower, a snake, and a spider, and a couple of other things. And then you see how much the baby's pupil dilates, right? And to just sort of measure excitement. Um, and so that's the thing. It could be fear, it could be excitement, it could be anything. So, in fact, the research that concludes, uh, this, this study says that, hey, you know what? Um, there is a heightened stimulus when you're shown something like a spider or a snake. Uh, but there's no behavioral response. There's no like, you know, screaming or trying to get out of there. It's just pupil dilation. You are recognizing shapes like spiders and snakes, uh, but you still don't know how you're going to respond to that. And how you respond to that is learned behavior. It, it's something that comes as you grow up um, and see people around you. If you see someone flipping out and throwing a shoe at something, then you're going to do the same thing. You're going to grow up saying, hey, unless you're one of those exceptionally empathetic, really sweet people who's like, hey, why are you throwing that shoe? Let me question my own reality. Uh, chances are you're going to pick it up from, well, whatever you see around you. So that's the science of arachnophobia, plus centuries worth of colonization, brainwashy religious sentiments, and the complex neurosocial process of monkey see, monkey do. But if you went back into folklore and indigenous cultures, there's no dearth for spider appreciation. Interestingly, if you look at South America, mm. there's a lot of folklore there about um, a spider that wove the sky into place mm. and put all the stars over there and everything else. Very similar story in uh, among the indigenous communities of Australia. Oddly, there's also... The, almost the exact same story, but with a little more detail that's been documented from the Andamans. Oh. Um, the great Andamanese uh, tribe have this lovely story um, of this goddess who wove the sky into place. And then when she was done, she came down to earth and she created one island for man and she created another island for herself where mm. she rested. And every time men, uh, men folk did something stupid, Mm -hmm. which she particularly asked them not to do and therefore they were going to do it mm -hmm. she'd get pissed off and she would tear the sky open and rain down thunder and lightning <laughs> and everything so basically they associated her with the northeast monsoon the name for this goddess Bilika was also the word in their language for spider the African communities I think West African communities mm -hmm. had a goddess no was he a god yeah he was a trickster god named Anansi mm -hmm. um and it's really cool because one, there are all these wonderful folklore stories that are all about how Anansi is in a sticky position mm -hmm. and he tricks himself out of it. Right. So Anansi is particularly interesting because through the unfortunate years of the slave trade, when mm -hmm. some of uh, these West African communities were being taken to the Jamaican plantations and main, mainland America, mm -hmm. um, it was... Apparently, the stories of Anansi that sort of kept spirits up, among other things, uh, mm -hmm. because there were stories of the little guy defeating a bigger enemy using, mm -hmm. using intelligence and, you know, tricks and stuff like that. So it's really cool because in terms of pop culture, mm -hmm. um, Anansi hit the mainstream and Neil Gaiman uh, wrote a book called The Anansi Boys. Oh. 
so you should definitely check that out. It's a, it's a lovely book. It has nothing to do really with spiders, okay. but heavily goes into this uh, into stories of this trickster god told in different ways. Exploring this whole side of human spider relationships can be quite fascinating because there is a rich history there. Mm. Um if you look at weaving communities, mm. right? The word arachne comes from the Greek myth about uh, you know the weaver arachne weaving better than minerva and mm-hmm. then she getting pissed off about the whole thing mm-hmm. uh but what few people i mean at least in india tend not to know is that we have a lot of communities here right in the south um that are the shalis mm-hmm. so we have the padma shali community and a bunch of others uh they are all historically weaving communities mm-hmm. and these are all offshoots of an older sali community Hmm. from where they get the padma sali and the, all of these um and the word sali mm-hmm. in proto dravidian means spider oh which then translated onto weaver okay and some of them sort of made that association readily even if you look at india mm-hmm. um the book called the periya puranam mm-hmm. um in which there's a story of a chola king this mm-hmm. is the early cholas there's a king called king kochengan Okay. Or Kochenga Cholan. His story was that in his previous birth he was a spider. Huh. And that story goes that there was this spider and this elephant that were both devotees of Lord Shiva. Mhm. And uh, they were both like, you know, we're going to impress him. Right. Um and when Sir Shiva came down and he was a linga in this in this place, the elephant would come every day and wash him. Mhm. With a spray of water and the spider was also concerned because after this spray there were leaves falling on the lingam and covering it mm-hmm. in leaves so he said this is untidy i need to create something to protect him so mm-hmm. the spider wove a layer of silk over him mm-hmm. to protect him from falling leaves now the elephant and spider i guess uh, this, this also sounds like the earliest story of uh, workplace rivalry in india mm-hmm. whereas i will impress the boss <laughs> right. before you um <laughs> <laughs> But um, amidst that little quarrel, they ended up killing each other. And so Shiva was so touched by the this whole by by these two said, um, you know, elephant, you can like come to heaven because you know you didn't really do anything. But spider, because you bit him first, mm-hmm. um, you're going to have you're going to be born again as a oh. human being. Mm. It's just like the worst thing that can. So happen. interesting, right? That a spider was punished. <laughs> <laughs> to become a human being. Right. Ah, uh, but he was also like, listen, you were cool, like being my devotee and stuff like that. So you can be king of the jungle. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Well placed so. human. Um. So so this is something else that I I think at least for me I I like to do it because and of course there's a lots of people say there's a danger in that humanizing them a bit. But I think spiders do have so many uh human like or better than human qualities like. parenthood motherhood yeah. um kinky stuff mm-hmm. uh lots of bdsm yeah. all sorts yeah, so yeah. if you could just uh, tell me how spiders are so much like us right in so many ways <laughs> um no yeah but starting off with that same caveat that you did the anthropomorphizing mm. that may not be the best thing to do mm. um there are ways to look at some of their um well their lives and look at parallels with us mm. uh just to i don't know maybe start building that bridge towards empathy yeah um, exactly so if you look at parenthood like you said mm. very 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 caring mothers uh to the point where wolf spiders mm-hmm. uh for example will carry their baby uh, their eggs in an egg sack at the back oh and they'll take them everywhere they go mm-hmm. when the babies hatch there are about maybe 100 plus tiny little ones mm-hmm. they all climb onto their mother's back Oh. And they stay there for about two weeks, and she takes care of them oh, during wow. that entire time. One last piggyback ride from your old man. There's a jumping spider in Japan, I think, or uh, China, I forget. But uh, mm-hmm. jumping spider called Toxius magnus, mm-hmm. which they found um, extrudes a milk-like substance, mm-hmm. which she feeds her babies. So there's almost suckling type behavior now mm-hmm. found in spiders. Um, so wow. parenthood is quite. all over the spider world mm. because you brought up the kink <laughs> uh, another interesting story i like to especially do in my spider sessions whether it's kids adults um is 
with the golden orb weaver mm-hmm. if have you have you seen the male of the golden orb weaver i i haven't i don't but you've seen so. the female yeah, the big large the huge spider yeah, she's massive. um the male is probably the size of my thumbnail oh oh so yes be extra careful mm. these things so when he finally makes his way to the, the female's web and this was something i watched in hesargata over many hours very creepy like that sitting <laughs> watching a romantic afternoon oh. no privacy so yeah so the male shows up mm-hmm. and he's uh, well he's sort of asking for permission to come down he's like hey can i and if she doesn't mm-hmm. uh, give him the right signal so some of them strum the web mm-hmm. to sort of signal that they're here and if she says yes then they can come down mm-hmm. and so i was watching this right and then the male comes down right then a bee flies into the web and so she's like yeah no i'm going to eat now and so he still slowly tries to crawl down <laughs> and she gives him a swift kick in the face oh my gosh and he runs terrified for his life he goes up and he's waiting again and then she's done with her bee and then he slowly climbs down so that that's that's a very interesting take away for me because well consent consent yes right? absolutely a very very key element to learn from spiders as right. well right <laughs> and once he's down there he's not going to directly go and start mating so in this golden orb weaver group mm-hmm. the males are also known to do something during mating mm-hmm. to calm the female down mm-hmm. so they take their spinnerets and gently rub it on her back oh my god that's good oh oh go low go low go low go low oh 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 uh. so they basically giving her a back massage to calm her down and some foreplay yes it's important <laughs> and this tiny little spider seems to know that yeah sometimes when we're sort of drawing parallels with human concepts right mm-hmm. and anthropomorphizing if we talk about something like intelligence mm-hmm. we look at posha as this extremely intelligent little spider uh, but especially when you consider that her entire central nervous system could fit on the head of a pin <laughs> um, wow. and here she's making these complex decisions right um, but we're able to call it intelligence and look at these things within the boundaries of what we perceive as intelligence mm. right mm. um you may not necessarily have a spider that you know solves derivatives for you but how do you measure the intelligence of a creature that's able to detect the electricity in the air using the hair on its legs mm. before it releases a line of silk and flies away you stop and say hey Mm-hmm. and there's this thing called intelligence that i know i can relate to mm-hmm. let me look for it in something else but in a slightly different way right let me try to redefine what intelligence is um especially when i take into consideration some of these things mm-hmm. and i think at the heart of that at the heart of finding these things that you can relate to humans mm-hmm. um both in the conventional and unconventional ways starts with just observing stuff starts with natural history mm-hmm. right you just watch something be i mean lab experiments are crucial towards defining certain behaviors and understanding things in a certain way mm-hmm. but there's so much to be learned um both from a scientific perspective as well as a cultural and imaginative perspective mm. from just watching things in nature right I agree. I I guess that's what uh, I one would start with that that actually pretty much answers my next question which is what as urbanites can we do uh you know welcome spiders look out for them it starts with mm. what you just said. Uh anything else that you want to add to that and particularly with regards to this question? Well specifically there I would say a lot of us when we think of nature right mm-hmm. uh when we think of I mean to get away we want to go to a resort that's close to a tiger reserve mm-hmm. or maybe even go on a safari into the tiger reserve yeah our idea of nature is something that you have to go towards mm-hmm. but it's important to understand that one nature is all around us mm-hmm. um but also fundamentally we are a part of nature right we're just another species on earth mm-hmm. um i think that's a crucial point to just sort of internalize before you're looking at something rather than look at it yeah. as an us versus them it's it's us and it's all of us mm-hmm. um and that gives you so, some semblance of how you share your home how you set it up um and once you have done that it's inevitable right life finds its way into mm-hmm. every nook and cranny whether you like it or not yeah. um it's unfortunate that we live in these heavily concretized spaces mm-hmm. but even going down this building the number of things we saw there yeah. the garden i mean we've just set up a couple of pots 
um, we have what five or six different spiders there mm-hmm. three different species of ants foraging around mm-hmm. um, there's a fall sit in our living room with mm-hmm. her babies so all of these are you know experiences waiting to be had as urbanites there's mm-hmm. a lot of things that are likely to be unfamiliar to us especially when it comes to different forms of life mm-hmm. and that unfamiliarity is a very thin line mm-hmm. um, and if you fall on one side you're likely to just fall slip into fear mm mm-hmm. and on the other side is this wonderful world of just you know things you would have never imagined you will see hear feel and think right um that's just waiting for you yeah yeah so just uh, have an open mind and perhaps don't uh, meticulously militantly clean out every cobweb i suppose mm. <laughs> that that's a that's a tricky one because usually when i end my spider sessions with uh, well, colleges and schools and mm. stuff they're like hey this was really touching and you know i'm really going to think about all the spiders in my house but so how do i deal with cobwebs Mm-mm. and there's real really no answer there um, yeah yeah no that's a yeah. that's a tough one i suppose it depends on so many people in the mm. house as well what i usually do is leave inhabited spider webs be the abandoned or broken ones i dust off i get that this might not be easy for everyone to do but my kitchen window spider web curtain keeps out midges and flies and mosquitoes for sure score. Oh well, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for saying yes and for doing this. Well, thank you for <laughs> listening to me babble on about spiders for an hour. Humans haven't even begun to fully fathom the inner workings of a spider. Whether it's science defying intelligence or what appears to be better than human emotional IQs, spiders really are creatures that are more than worthy of our respect and our attention. I do think they're damn cool with their magic wand spinnerets, super silk and cliffhanger lifestyles. They're the true webmasters and warlocks of the universe. You can follow John on Instagram at 8legged blues and follow Spiders in the Sea at Spiders and the Sea for some super awesome content that him and his wife Chetna curate. You can follow the show on Instagram and Twitter at Tigers on Tuk Tuk and don't forget to rate or review the show based on where you're listening. I've been thrilled by a couple of new reviews that some of you left me. Thanks for that. And the stats tell me that I've got more and more listeners, but please do spread the word. The more the merrier and I'd really want to stick around for a good while and make more podcast episodes for you. Okay, I will see you 2 weeks from now. Until then, you hang tight. Bye-bye.